Heavenly Father, we praise you on this wonderful Sabbath day. Father, we must do your bidding. That's what we are put here for. We must make decisions and choices, and we ask, Lord, that we make them through your spirit, through the marshalship of your son, and through the wisdom of your throne. Be with us this Sabbath day, that your Holy Spirit may be here. Lord, that we get this work done, and we can go home, and the solution to the problem is the return of your son. May we be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks. We're going back to uh, Matthew 24. We're going to finish up there with the woes. Uh, we're talking about the word fornication in the Bible and what the true application is to God's people. It's not what we're accustomed to hearing and accustomed to dealing with, as it were. It's a spiritual sense. And it's man becoming God. A.D. 44, Rome. Something happened. Does anybody know what it was? And it's played down in history. But it was extremely significant to religion. A man named Julius Caesar, something happened to him. 23 of his most trusted friends and senators did something to him while he sat on his throne in the Senate. And as the story goes, the last knife that went in, the 23rd, was whose? His best confidant and friend, Brutus. But that's as the story is told. And he said, you too, Brutus. And he died. What happened? Why? Why did the Romans do that to their most victorious, arguably, leader they ever had? Caesar did something when he came back from Egypt and the wars over there. He was quite triumphant. But he did something that the Romans wouldn't have. And that his best friend, Brutus, made the statement, will you be involved in this? And he said, while Caesar is my best friend, Rome is my country. And the law is what must stand. Caesar did something when he came back. He declared himself what? God. That was the issue. Did you know that? He made a statue, and on the day of its dedication, which was the end of February, they rolled the statue out. Well, it was already there. And Caesar was going to announce that he was God. Do you know what happened in that square? A very amazing thing happened. See, the, the situation with Caesar and Pilate in this situation were very similar, and I'm going to tell you why. Birds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of birds filled that square and started dive bombing the people. They said this was a sign from the gods. Nobody could hear Caesar's announcement. That was a supernatural event. They all knew it. Caesar had dreams just prior to his assassination that he was going to be assassinated. Did you know that? There was a prophet that came. The, the term Eyes of March came from that prophet. He said, beware of the Eyes of March. Caesar told, was told that. The guy came into the palace and told him that. His wife told him, don't do this. What was the problem? And by the way, Caesar's palace and Vatican were right across from each other. What was the problem, do you suppose? Why did God seek to interfere, interfere in Caesar's announcement of declaring himself to be God? Folks, this is fornication. Oh, he wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, but you know up until that point, well, till the third century, they were still keeping Sabbath. There was no Sunday worship. That happened when man did what? Do you see what God was doing? Does it make sense? They were being evangelized still. You see, there was no Pope. Who does the Pope claim to be? Why hasn't that happened to him? Well, it wasn't time yet. 
God was not allowing this to happen because there were a lot of events to come, were there not? This was A.D. 44. Who had just died? What was happening in Jerusalem? We, you know, Rome has arranged these facts in their own interests. But Caesar declaring himself to be God would have really messed up what do you suppose in Rome. You think that would have had a lot to do with the evangelism of the new Christian faith? Because were the apostles and so on allowed to come and go freely through Rome at that time? Were there any problems with the Romans and the apostles at that time? No. As a matter of fact, they were annoyed at the Pharisees. At the Pharisees. You look like me. <laughs> and all their prodding and pushing to wipe out this sect of Christianity. The Romans weren't happy with all that. They were trying to get them arrested. They were trying, and Paul was going through something. I don't know exactly if, no, he wouldn't have been in Rome at that time. But did not Paul get arrested and was brought to Rome? And was he not evangelizing at that point? Did he not have freedom to come and go? And he had who coming to see him for Bible studies? The emperor's court. Many of them were hearing the gospel message. If Caesar had declared himself to be the only God and directed all the worship to himself, what would have happened to that evangelism, do you suppose? Caesar was warned by God, and Caesar was not a bad ruler for the people. He really wasn't. He stopped a lot of other stuff that was going on. What would he have done? What would have happened to the evangelism effort at that point? He was warned three times that I'm aware of not to do this. Up until the time he was killed, he could have repented. Does that sound like Pilate? Wasn't Pilate warned not to have anything to do with Christ? I wonder if Caesar knew about Pontius Pilate. Of course, he was away. He was messing around with Cleopatra at that time. But you see, folks, God is not happy with this kind of fornication. Man declaring himself to be God. Man establishing doctrine. You see, didn't Jesus say that wasn't acceptable? Didn't he say it was in vain? So the assassination of Caesar, in my estimation, and I must point that out, was the providence of God. He gave him an option three times. Three, in his own mind, you should, he wrote down the vision he had about his own assassination. And you know what he said it was? Ah, just a dream. But that was strange for them because they believed in their dreams. You see? His wife, I can't remember the name of the guy, the seer, that came to, into his palace and tell him, beware of the eyes of March. He knew exactly what that meant. You're going to be assassinated. He laughed. He said, that's part of the dream. Folks, when man gets in his head that he's God, there's no changing. Pilate did it for different reasons. But Caesar, had he become as Nebuchadnezzar with his plane of Dora and him being the head of gold, you see, there would be no evangelism in Rome. And was it important for Rome to be evangelized at that period? Just as important as this country is today, as Mrs. White has said, this country will finish the work. God did not make a mistake by choosing the United States to finish the work. She makes that plain statement. Rome was a key player in evangelizing the world. Why? Why? What, what did they say about Rome? They owned and ruled. All roads led to Rome. Rome was still abuzz with what happened even 10 years later in Jerusalem with a man named Jesus Christ. You see, Caesar would have squashed all that. So, these Pharisees, make no doubt about it, these leaders set themselves up as Caesars. 
It wasn't time for the Pope in the Vatican across the way from Caesar's palace to declare himself God. It wasn't time yet. It's funny because Caesar could see the Vatican from his, the way I understand it, his bedroom window. And he wanted to be the Roman God. God of gods. So, folks, as we study this, these things are no accident and mistake. When you see major players like this changed, it's God's hand. Make just as much as it was with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Cody, he was the leader of the world. Um... Just a couple things about the facts here. Uh, Julius Caesar, he was alive and murdered in 44 BC. Oh, did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 44 BC. His yeah, son yeah, Augustus, yeah. our Octavian, he was that. around at the time. So, the as far as him and Pilate knowing each other, he wouldn't. No, no, you're right, Cody. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was BC. Now, thank you for correcting that. I had a lot going on this morning. But the point is, it wasn't time for that. There was a lot to happen yet for man to declare himself God, the leader of the world. Cleopatra told Caesar he was God. Did you know that? So we see these events shaping up and taking place. You're right, Cody. It was <laughs> B.C. But all these things were happening. And as we see man setting himself up, to be God in these leadership positions, it becomes extremely detrimental to God's cause. The Pharisees in the first century church were doing what? What did they do? They had their own rules. They had their own laws. If you didn't obey them, you were what? Gone. People were afraid of that. Matthew 24, 5. Uh, Cody, I'm so glad. Yes, you stretch 100 years. What doesn't matter? But the whole dynamic, my point is, the whole religious dynamic would have changed greatly at that point. Because the Roman government was, our government was set up after the Roman government. Did you know that? Our republic, our laws, many were taken from their constitution. It was deeply studied because it was such a just system. The dynamics would have changed. It wasn't to be a dictatorship. It wasn't to be a theocracy. It was to be a republic by the rule of law. And they had many good laws. That would have all changed. And the evangelism of that region would have changed greatly. Because he was throwing back to these guys who claimed to be God. And you can only pray to so-and-so. Remember Daniel? Why did he get thrown in the lion's den? can only pray to who? The king. Did that change, you think, things a little bit with the Seventh-day Adventists that were still in captivity? You better believe it. You have to bow at the plain of Dora. To who? Well, Caesar, was. he put that statue up there. And what do you think he would have had people doing to that statue? And do you think that the proceeding up till that time we were talking about with Paul and all would have said, no, nah, I don't want that claim. Well, I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. That's how they ruled. That's how they did it. Don't forget, this is how the Egyptians believed their leaders, who and what they were. They were God. They became the sun. That's interesting because when he came back from Egypt, this is what was in his head. Remember? He was hanging around with Cleopatra. She called him God. I wonder where he got that idea from. Anyhow, so when men are worshipped by men, they take the title of God. Jesus, in Matthew 24, uh, 23, is exposing this. And he goes on in verse 27... Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. This is uh, chapter 23, because I think I said 24 before. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you are like unto whitewashed sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Folks, this is a culmination of everything he said prior to this. Because what did he say about making 
the members of their church twice the children of hell as they are? What did he say about you search the world over for a proselyte? What did he say about you stop men from entering the kingdom? That's what they are. That's what these churches are. If God's law is not being obeyed and enforced and the Holy Spirit is not in charge of that church, you can look at these beautiful churches and what are they? Would that, do you think, description fit? A whitewashed sepulcher, a nice, clean, beautiful building, but what's inside? You know what a sepulcher is, a mausoleum. Dead men's bones. That's what's inside. It's interesting the analogy that Jesus uses because to me it's timeless. It's timeless because you've got Caesar ruling over you and you're bowing to Caesar. You know, you could even use that today. How many people will do exactly what the government says because they're getting something from the government? Do you know anybody like that? You know anybody like that? They'll vote for politicians because why? You know that the Constitution of this country does not give you the right to vote. You know that, right? How many people know that? Actually, it's the opposite. It simply says, if you are eligible, because there were limitations to who had the right to vote. <laughs> How many people know that? If you were not a landowner, you could not vote. Why did the Founding Fathers put that in the Constitution? What did it mean? What was the implication of that in the, Bill, uh, in the Bill of Rights. What was that implication or in, in, the, in the Constitution? Who were the landowners? They were the captains of industry. Of course, they're painted to us as wicked people who only beat slaves all day long. But they were the captains of industry. Every president up until a certain point was a businessman in this country. And they didn't want to be president. They wanted to go back to running their businesses. They hated it. Folks, if the government is giving, if somebody is giving you money, and that's where your livelihood is coming from, who are you going to vote for? The old statement, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. You see, if you are getting things, and the way you translate that into today, if you're being given monetary gain and your living is coming from the government, you should not have the right to vote. Are you going to vote for the country? Are you going to vote for the betterment of society? Or are you going to vote for what you're getting? You're going to vote for yourself. They were pretty smart people back then. You see... If you have a job, and it doesn't mean you have to own a house. If you have a job, you're paying taxes, and you're not getting anything from the government, then you have the right to vote. Because what are you going to vote for? Think about it. We even had a president that said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. They put a bullet in his head. <laughs> and he was a Democrat. <laughs> he was a Democrat. But things have changed so much. So, you see, these whitewashed sepulchers full of dead bones make slaves out of people. Jesus knew that. He said, know the truth and what? Know the truth and what? You're not going to be anybody's slave. It shall set you free. Men's laws and rules shackle you to what? To them. And you're dead. Twice as dead as they are. So he said to them, verse 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. And say, if we had been in those days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. They said that? Wow. Wow. So they denounced on the surface what their fathers did in killing, can you name some of the prophets that they killed? Isaiah, Jeremiah, on and on and on and on. Banished them, beat them, boiled them, cut them in half. But yet, what were they planning to do to Jesus? He sent them, did he not? 
they had the most heinous death prepared for him. You see, because at least these guys died within the realm of their own people. Where did Jesus die? You know about the red heifer sacrifice, right? You all know about that, right? The significance of that. Why Jesus was that sacrifice. Because where did he get crucified? Very important. Outside the gates of the city. The red heifer. Outside the gates of the city. I'm not going to go into that. But Jesus was denounced as the foulest of all the dissenters of the Pharisees' way of life. And today, what are we doing to Ellen White? You think that would fit today? You know, I heard this week a very interesting statement that now we have become those people as Americans who are trying to make a perfect past. Boy, that hit me. I said, you're absolutely correct. This group and that group and this happened then and this happened. What's it got to do with the future? Can anybody tell me that? What does that have to do with the future? And the amazing thing is, when you try and make a perfect past, and this person pointed this out, you change the past. For instance, let's get rid of all the Civil War monuments. Is that changing the past on a very important subject? You better believe it. We need to put more up to remind people what took place and why and how many Americans died because of it. Oh no, that never happened. Really? That's how we're going to deal with it? So, when you see that type of a thing, and Jesus mentions it here. You did all this in the past, but now you're making it a wonderful, and you're condemning those people. But what are they just getting ready to do? <laughs> He says, your father's the devil. He's a murderer and a liar from the beginning. We looked at that. Folks, this is what we have today in our churches. Was this just for his time? Are there God men running around all over the place? Spiritual fornication? Why is it that the Jews did not know about all the differences between what Jesus said and the Pharisees said. Why didn't they know? Why didn't they know that the Pharisees were liars and deceivers and demon-possessed people? Oh, we don't like to use that word today. Even for mental illness, we have all these different explanations for it. The Bible has one explanation for it. The Bible has one explanation. Is there genetic defect? Yes, but where does it come from? Where does the genetic defect come from? Principles, biblical principles that are not followed. However, as polluted as the planet is, that's not even a given anymore. However, when you see acts of what just took place down that is demonic activity. For a 19-year-old to be that cold-blooded at that age... But we have a society, even Seventh-day Adventists, their entertainment is sex and violence. Even Seventh-day Adventists. Show me one Hollywood movie that does not break one or all the commandments. One. Christmas, all spiritualism. That's demonic activity. And then the amazing thing to me is this guy didn't blow his head off. I have a problem with that. He tried to get away. Really? You have no remorse for your action? Really? There's no conscience. The Holy Spirit's gone. Am I judging him? By their fruit you shall know who they are. So what do they start screaming? Gun control. It has nothing to do with guns. Nothing. That's knee-jerk emotion. Nothing. This was a killer, a demon-possessed killer that was created by our society. We have no rules, no regulations. These kids don't even know if they're male or female. God made a mistake. Well, there's no God, except Caesar. 
Because he's letting me do all this, you see. Uh, Liz. There was a comment made by uh, uh, the major of Kentucky, and he was saying how it's not about gun control, it's about the movies, the games, and all the stuff that parents are allowing their children to play with. I mean, I, I had a student yesterday that the, you know, uh, the teacher brought them to, our, to the office. They're playing this game that supposedly you hit someone in the neck. And we don't allow any of the, you know, anyone to touch anyone or, you know, there's rules that they have to follow. But then when I address the parent, she's asking, where did you see that? Because, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking she doesn't allow him to do these, to see anything that promotes this stuff. Well, he said, Netflix and uh, to YouTube. Netflix and YouTube. It is, it is devastating what these parents don't realize. They're making their children because they're allowing them to do this. Mm -hmm. Rap music. We know about rock and roll. Who is the father of rap music, by the way? Do you know? I know you know. I know you got to know, Sherrod. I'm not saying you listen to it. I, Cody, you know. Tupac. Big tribute to him this week because of black has Do you know who he was? Do you know why he was murdered? And he was a gangster. He killed people. He dealt drugs. Jesus Christ is not a role model for, and Seventh-day Adventist kids are listening to this garbage, pounding it into the brain from when they're this big. Do you know, go look up the history of this guy. He was friends with, guess who? The Castros. He was murdered by a rival gang sitting in his car. Samuel, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, we'll wait for the microphone. But this is a role model I heard this week on the radio. Black History Month. Oh, Tupac. He was one of the great black artists. Um, I used to be a New York City correction officer. Okay. And you know what I'm talking Tupac about. Tupac was in Rikers Island. <laughs> For what? For what? I don't remember, but he was there. It wasn't nice, whatever it no, was. it wasn't. It wasn't nice. That's just all. His car that he was murdered in, his BMW, was just is, is valued over $2 million to $3 million. This is a murderer. He's probably killed some people you may know. <laughs> and you might say, oh, that's a pretty bold statement. Well, he was a gangbanger in California. That's where he came from. One of the things um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about just with what Liz is saying and things I've heard from uh, um, my friend JP, he talked about uh, second graders having pornography on their phones. Mm -hmm. It's a very common thing, you know. Um, Generation X, they inherited technology. Mm -hmm. Even the millennials, to a certain extent, inherited technology. Mm -hmm. But what we have now, we have music available 24-7, either by app or by iPod or by whatever. We have movies available we have shows available 24 7 in the ears and the eyes of every individual if they want it at least in this country and many other countries across the world because almost everybody's got a smartphone for some reason they don't have plumbing but they have a smartphone. and they don't have food right so we've reached a very i would say volatile path where these these children are being weaned on technology. They're given an iPad to play with and to look at and they learn how to use that thing way better than any of us can. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, you give a kid a phone, you have a safety, parent safety lock on, they'll jailbreak it. They know how to do it. Yeah. It's just like, you, it's just like, uh, you know, uh, in older times and in, in recent times too, you say, you tell your kids not to use drugs and you think, you think you cut off every avenue, but you know what? They can still get it and you know it because you've been a kid too. Yeah. Yeah. And That's Cody, going have. back, and, and you might say, what does this have to do with Matthew 23? Who's sanctioning all this? Who's sanctioning this? Who gives these people their blessing? Rome. Have you heard any pope ever speak out against this stuff? I haven't. Matter of fact, a lot of the entertainers are friends. Because they're his disciples. 
spreading his message. Folks, this is Matthew 23. Make no doubt about it. Because the church could stop it. What do you think would happen if this pope stood up and said, uh, go ahead. Uh, Tupac uh, has a song called Hail Mary, too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. They all do. You will find Roman and, and Catholicism through all of this stuff. Folks, this is Matthew 23. This is what Jesus was talking about. You don't believe me? I don't know what to tell you because in my mind it's solid. For what purpose? What end? Evangelizing for what purpose? This is evangelism. For what purpose? Who's going to restore the peace? Why, months ago, a year ago, this shooter down in South Florida was exposed to the FBI in full regalia and his intention, and what did they say? Because the Broward County Sheriff said if he could have, he would have busted him right then and there, but he couldn't touch him. The FBI said there's no threat here. Sherrod. Folks, this is all part of the deal. Whitewashed sepulchers full of dead bones, you better believe it. You know, um, I agree with you. I've been doing, this is, this is designed, and the, the template for this design is found in scripture. It, it has its origins there. One interesting thing that I found in my study is that the magicians in Egypt, which Paul mentions them in 2 Timothy as Janus mm -hmm. and Jambres, okay, mm -hmm. uh, among them. Mm -hmm. The magicians in Egypt, the word used to, um, the Hebrew word for magician is actually only applied to the Egyptian um, sorcerers. To the Egyptian sorcerers. Wow. Now, the only other place where it's mentioned is in Babylon with Daniel. Okay? But even there, they have Egyptologists believe that it's basically a reference to the ones from Egypt. So they basically copied what Egypt had done in Babylon. Now this is the interesting point. I'm, I'm not gonna make it too long, but I have to explain mm -hmm. it. The word for magician, okay, is a Hebrew word and it shares roots with another Hebrew word that means stylus, which is a stylus for a tablet. Now, now follow this. This is very, very revealing, I believe. A stylus for writing on a tablet, which was an ancient tablet at mm -hmm. that time, of course. But that same root word is the tool that Aaron used in forming, fashioning the golden calf. Okay, and when, remember when Moses came to him, he said, what happened? And, and what did Aaron say? Aaron said, I just took the just gold out of the fire. and all of a sudden this calf came out. What did he leave out? He left out the fashioning tool. Yeah. And that tool shares the same root word, only used for the magicians who worked in concert with the sorcerers and the wise men in Egypt. Interesting. And so what I'm saying is trying to actually support what you're saying in well, that this is, this is by design, yep. that there are people in high places who are seeing to it that the design is carried out a certain way, mm -hmm. and Satan knows that his roots can be traced back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Of course. That's, I'm glad you shared that. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Now what he just brought out, music, where does it come from? One word. Ancient word, muse. What is a muse? You will have artists, Joni Mitchell, um, I can't think of all of them, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, go on and on, who say they are creative when their muse is what, what is a muse, folks? What is it? It's a mythological spirit. When you get these high-ranking artists, Pete Townsend, you all know who he is, one of the most famous rockers in the world, the who? When I'm on stage, he says, and I'm quoting, I am not in control. There is another spirit that takes over his muse. And he says, if you were to step on stage while I'm performing, I very probably would try and kill you. And I have. Who used to destroy their instruments? Who was famous for that? The who? Do you know why they did that? Again, quoting Townsend. They had no control over it. 
That was the muse. Folks, Matthew 23, who's sanctioning this activity? Why did the Seventh-day Adventists sanction homosexuality? We haven't even gotten into that yet because it's all part of this. Ezekiel 8. Let's read a little bit of it. What was Ezekiel shown was going on? And, you know, Sherrod, I'm very glad you brought that up because this is very relative to Ezekiel 8 in my mind. And the interesting thing is the person that was leading this, his father was one of the reformers of Israel during Jos uh, uh, King Josiah's time. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we're going to skip down to verse 4. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up your eyes, now the way towards the north. So I lifted my, my eyes to the way towards the north and beheld northward the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. Now that word, well, image of jealousy is to create, to procure, purchase, procure, recover, redeem. What would that be in the entryway? Who, would, who approaches the temple from the north, by the way? God. So what vision of jealousy would be there? Who procured and redeemed? You see what he sees there? It's bold. It's bold. What's supposed to be there? It says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up your eyes towards the way of the... No, I read that. Verse 5, he said, Furthermore, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here, that I should go off from my sanctuary? What, God's not there anymore? They're saying, the leaders of the church, that God's not in the sanctuary anymore. What's in the ways of the north? But turn your eyes again, and you shall see great abominations. And he, uh, greater, I'm sorry, you're right, there's a wrinkle there in my book. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, beheld the door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing and abominate, abominable beasts. Romans 1. Romans 1. And all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So what was in there? Isn't that interesting? And there stood before me 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. All of them. Who are these people? Who are these 70 elders? The leaders. The general conference leaders. Does it omit one of them? Why? They won't have them. Weren't they killing the prophets that were warning them about this? They won't have them. So folks, I'm telling you, the whole body's polluted. I'm not saying it. It's here. And they're worshiping idols. They're into Satanism. And they're telling the people, God has left his sanctuary. And listen to this. And there stood there 70 of the men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In the midst of them, Jazaniah, the son of Shaphaham. Do you know who he was? Do you know who his father was? Okay, let me tell you. It's very simple. When Josiah became king, Israel was deep into apostasy, was it not? The temple was boarded up. They weren't even using it. Do you remember? There was a priest that dug out. Josiah was bringing the worship back. There was a priest that dug out a scroll he found. And, read, and Josiah read it, and he was sick because they thought they were worshiping God according to the rules. But this scroll said, you're still way off. This is his son that's leading this. His father was responsible for bringing Israel back to true Seventh-day Adventist worship. So what does his son do? How did the devil get to him, I wonder? Did they see him after his father left, like Caesar? 
Did they see him as God? Was there some fornication going on there for this to spread through this body like this? Remember what went on with Josiah. He was the boy king. He brought Israel back to what? Proper sanctuary worship. That's who's leading this, which blows my mind. So this man is totally gone. His muse and his instruments of, of musicianry were well being used. Wouldn't you say? With every man, his censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. So what were the, what were the, what were the leaders of the church doing? Burning incense to who? The devil. Where? In the temple. On which side, by the way? In front of what? The emblem of Christ's blood for our salvation and the side of the north, which is how God approaches his temple. Who claimed to be king? Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of where? Why do you think Jesus said in his mind, this is how, what they're thinking, they're possessed. Why do you think Jesus said, if you think it, you've broken the law? Isn't that amazing? For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the earth. What? For you to take control of? What did the devil say he wanted to do? To ascend his throne where? Above the Most High. Now, how would he do that? By taking this group of men, God's left. Who's God now? Who's God? Who is God? Would you call this spiritual fornication? I certainly would, because it's produced brain damage, as the Holy Spirit has just shown Ezekiel. Because this is in their minds. We're great. We're worshiping birds and critters and creepy things and one another. This is how homosexuality gets into society. So if you want to go into these churches where the Ten Commandments are not held, you have, we're out of time, you have absolutely no interest in what goes on here, I'll guarantee you that. And you're only going for entertainment, and guess who's dancing for you? I don't care if it's independent or conference. Am I better than you? Absolutely not. I can say what Paul said. I'm a chief of sinners. I know my past, and I know what goes on in this knob. You see, and the great controversy is alive and well in my head. I'll tell you that right now. And I long for the day when it's not going to be. Because it takes up all my energy. You see? Folks, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Do you see why Jesus said Matthew 23? Does it make sense? Does it connect? You see why Caesar, and I'm thank you, Cody, for correcting that in, AD, in BC 44, had to die? If he claimed himself to be king, or God, God, not even king, God, God. Funny, he got that idea from the Egyptians, and they worshipped the sun god. And what day did Rome end up worshipping, by the way? Sunday. And as Sherrod pointed out, that was Egyptian religion. There was no other religion. They were proud of it, but we have leaders who give us what we want. You see, yeah, you can live like that, and you're still going to go to heaven. Don't you know you've offended the Pharisees? Isn't that what they told Jesus? Boy, he really offended them. Did he do it out of malice or love? Was he disappointed that he did not have the support of his disciples? You better believe it, because they didn't understand but he made concession for that. And he knew who was faithful and who was not. Because remember, it is the symbol of jealousy. Did God not say, I'm a jealous God? Folks, you can't apply that word in the way we do in our vernacular. That means he'll kill his own son for us. That's a little different. That comes under the category of love. I will do anything for you, except what? Give my law and rule over to man. Won't happen. In, in essence, that's doing away with his law. This is a predicament we're in, in my mind. Um, 
The Lord has done everything. The Holy Spirit, the Father, has done everything. Everything possible to get our attention. But we're brain damaged. Because we listen to the internet, we listen to politicians, we listen to preachers, everything and anything. Remember, the Holy Spirit comes to you with a megaphone and a brass band and amps and all that, right? Still small voice. Why? Because your mind has to be clear. Still small voice. And I pray every day that I hear that voice and I know what to do. But folks, being a Seventh-day Adventist is not always pleasant at all. Did Jesus have a nice, pleasant, easy life? But he had peace with who? Well, that, when you have, it doesn't matter what happens down here. But we're so convinced that we have to have everything down here. That we're willing to get rid of discipline, laws, rules, everything. And everything's going to be utopia. Folks... To know good from evil is not really a good thing, is it? As it was in the Garden of Eden. And that's part of this too, because it doesn't mean what you always hear. It means that God didn't want them to know good from evil. They already knew what God's law was. Did they not? They were not to experience the devil's wrath, which is what they ended up with. And we've carried it higher and further than the devil dreamed even unto the fact that we have 70 elders in this church that are doing exactly the same and worse so where do you expect us to be well with Christ being led by his spirit not by man we're out of time folks let's pray Heavenly Father, we come before your mighty throne this day, the Sabbath day, this wonderful crowning glory of creation, Lord. Of course, that's us, but the day of the week. To come and worship you, Father, to do your will, to be able to maybe affect a few souls, Father, to bring an end to the pain, the suffering, the bloodshed, the disappointment, Father, is the most important job that you have given us to do in the universe. Help us to complete this task individually and corporately. Help us to do your will. Be with Edward and Benjamin and people such as they who are functioning under great, great distress and under the threat of losing their lives. Help us, Lord, to overcome and to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.